So, okay. So Yu Huang is a, a, a PhD student at the University of Michigan. And uh, uh, I guess she's a, a final year. That's what the people say these days. And she's been doing a, a work at the intersection of uh, software engineering and education technologies. And uh, uh, as a very cool title with the word, whenever you have the word brain in the title, you know, it's gonna be a good talk. So I'm very excited to hear about this and you please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Lars, for the, for the introduction. So, hi everyone, I'm very happy to share my work with you today. So in this talk, I will introduce you to an exciting interdisciplinary research area of software engineering and cognitive science. So how can we objectively measure and understand the cognitive processes in software activities? What is going on in your brain when you are doing code? So in software development process and maintenance, and actually many domains in computer science, we always want to improve productivity and reduce the cost. However, software engineering is not only about machines or programs, and the humans, the developers, also play a very important role in software engineering. In fact, people have long been interested in investigating human behaviors in software activities. Actually, as early as 1968, research has already shown that there can be order of magnitude variations among individual developers. For example, a low performance individual may spend 28 times more time to debug the same code. So understanding the human aspect really matters. But the question for us is, how can we even know what causes the difference? Like how do different people make decisions? How can we figure out the way developers think? Or in other words, how can we measure and understand their cognitive processes when they are conducting these tasks? In psychology and cognitive science, Traditionally, researchers conduct behavioral experiments and use what we may call the stopwatch and score sheet approach. So uh, for example, they ask you to conduct certain tasks and simultaneously measure the time and the accuracy. Like uh, how long did, you, did it take for you to finish a task? How accurate your, your answer is? Well, this type of a measurement can work really well for software engineering projects. For example, I myself have been working on a checkpointing and a restoration algorithm for quadcopters. So what we do is we measure the time overhead and success rate for the system to recover. For instance, we check things like, oh, does the system finish 100% of the mission within 10 minutes, things like that. It is actually pretty straightforward and accurate to assess the quality of the work because there's no human involved. However, when our target research subjects are humans, these measures can only explain what happened, but often fail to explain why that happened. So this makes it really hard for research generalization, recommendation, and knowledge transfer. It may overlook what is actually going on behind the scenes and result in limited findings. So that's why people also use another approach that is self-reporting. Self-reporting is very commonly used to collect information on people's opinions. It's still a very super, like a super powerful tool for us. However, self-reporting may not work equally well in all the contexts. Research has shown that human biases in self-reporting may hurt the reliability of the results. Then the question for us is, is there any other solution that we can use? Can we go one step further? Can we directly check how people think or informally? Can we really remind? So the spoiler here is yes, and the approach is medical imaging. There are many medical imaging techniques. Two popular choices in recent years are called fMRI and fNIRS. So I will explain both of the measures later in this talk. So both fMRI and fNIRS are medical imaging techniques for looking inside your brain without cutting you open. That is actually a very important high level plan here. So both of them sample the brain rapidly with very high spatial resolution. 
there has been over 1,500 papers every year using fMRI and fNIRS in psychology, but it's still relatively new to computer science. Actually, there are less than a dozen such studies in software engineering. So why does that happen? Well, it might be because something called streetlight effects. So human beings turn to search for something where it's easiest to look. It hasn't been easy and feasible for software engineering people to adapt medical imaging to study users and developers in the past. The experiment environment, for example, in fMRI is very different from our daily working environment. So how can we mitigate the effects? That's a challenge. The nature of medical imaging requires something called contrast-based analysis as well as a rigorous controlled experimental design in, in tandem with the constraints of those medical imaging measurements. So the challenge is how can we do all of them for programming activities? Today, I will talk about how we overcome these challenges by introducing you three studies I have done that successfully use medical imaging to investigate the cognitive processes in different software engineering activities, including fundamental tasks such as data structure manipulations, how do you rotate a tree, as well as a higher level, more semantically rich and industry related tasks, such as code writing and code review. So before going into details of the first study, so right now I'm going to ask for a favor, favor from all the audience here. So I am inviting everyone now to make a hypothesis together. So have you ever played an arcade claw machine before? Just like the one in the movie Toy Story, if you ever watched it. So you have to move the claw to grab the Buzz Lightyear out of this, you know, green things. So also, do you still remember balancing a tree in your data structure class? So the question for you is, do you think these two activities are very much alike in the way of thinking? That's the question for you. If you think there are similar cognitive activities, please type yes in the Zoom chat channel. If not, just type no. So I, I will travel. Let's wait for about maybe 10 seconds for everyone to make a decision. So I, I will travel Lars maybe after 10 seconds to show me like, you know, roughly what are people thinking? Like, do you think those two activities are very much alike on the neurological level? We are at 46 at the moment. Yeah, we'll have like a three seconds. Three, two, one. So Lars, can you can you tell me roughly like what do people think? About 80% no and 20% yes. 80% no and 20% yes. 70, okay. 70, 30. Okay, so everyone stay tuned. So our first study will solve the puzzle for us. So the high level question we want to investigate in the first study is, how do human brains represent data structures? Is it more like a text or more like a 3D objects? For example, when I'm thinking about rotating a tree, am I using the same part of my brain that I used to think about a word or a sentence like, oh, the tree is balanced? Or am I using the part of my brain that I used to rotate a 3D object like this? So we may have learned about data structures, you know, when we were taking, I don't know, like a data structure class in undergrad and already know the formalism for them. But the question is, what is the formalism for rotating 3D objects? Well, in psychology, we call this spatial ability. It refers to the determination of spatial relationships between objects and the mental manipulation of spatially presented information. For example, the claw machine we mentioned before, like in the hypothesis, it largely involves spatial ability. In psychology, spatial ability is usually measured by mental rotation tasks, just like the animation of the 3D object from the previous slide. So it is also not something completely new for engineering. For example, people have already studied the role of spatial ability in education and success in STEM majors. So you may have a question here for me, like, you know, we're talking about data structure manipulations, like trees or leaves, but why are we looking at spatial ability at the same time? Well, except for the consideration of research implications, it is also due to how medical imaging works. 
While there are a lot of things involved for medical imaging studies in software engineering, or at least for my studies, there are only four things you need to know. What are fMRI and fNIRs? What are bold signals? What is a contrast design, which actually explains why we put spatial ability with data structures together to investigate? And lastly, what do we need to be careful about in brain data analysis? So in the next few slides, before discussing the experimental design and the findings of this very first study on data structures and the spatial ability, I will introduce these four things to you one by one. First, what are fMRI and fNIRs and how do they work? The two most popular medical imaging techniques in the world right now. So fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. FNIRS stands for Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. So the mechanism of fMRI and FNIRS is actually kind of similar. So they both measure the brain activities by calculating the so-called bold signal, which I will explain on the next slide. So we can use either fMRI or FNIRS to figure out which brain areas are associated when we are thinking. But actually, their setups are quite different. So just let me simplify it for you here. fMRI uses magnets, while FNIRS uses light. fMRI can look deeper into our brain than FNIRS. So these are two pictures here on the slide of the fMRI and FNIRS machines I used in my studies. So the left one here is the fMRI machine shown like covered in those um, mermaid stickers. So the stickers are used to calm down children because they also have experiments with really young children. So you lie down in this big magnetic tube. In comparison, the right picture shows the setup for FNIRS. You just need to wear a special cap sit in front of a monitor and type on the keyboard as usual, just like what you do every day when you're doing your you know, programming tasks. By the way, I made this cap myself and surprisingly, it turned out to be a very interesting task. We can talk more about it after the talk if you're interested. So here in the right FNIRS picture, this is my undergrad advisee. So he was like doing a pilot FNIRS run there. So when we were doing, uh, when we were working on the study back in 2018, among those very few medical imaging studies, software engineering researchers mainly use the fMRI. But the fMRI is actually very expensive and it has a lot of constraints on the environment. And as you can see in the pictures here, once you lie down in the magnetic tube, you cannot really move. But by contrast, FNIRS is much cheaper and there's much more freedom of movement. But back then, we didn't really know if FNIRS was as powerful as fMRI for investigating software activities. So for the first time in software engineering, we decided to use both fMRI and FNIRS for this data structure study. So this gives us multiple research benefits. First, we can compare fMRI and fNIRS to provide suggestions for future research, like which one should you use. Secondly, by comparing the conclusions drawn from fMRI and fNIRS, it can address the concerns we have on the constraints of the fMRI environment. Now let's talk about bold signals. So bold signal is the blood oxygen level dependent signal. The basic idea here is our brain needs energy when we're thinking, but it does not store the energy. So when we're thinking, it needs the blood to bring the oxygen and to consume it. We use the blood flow and oxygen consumption as a proxy for brain activity. Notice that we don't directly measure brain activity. We use this proxy. We use hemodynamic response function to model brain activations, which can be estimated from the measured bold signals. Then we put everything, including the experimental stimulus, the, the hemodynamic uh, uh, reaction function, noise, everything together, and we will have a comprehensive quantitative model to measure brain activities. It is called the general linear model, GOM. So we won't spend too much time here on the math, but however, we're still not done yet. It is not so easy to measure brain activities yet. That is because brain activation doesn't work like this, like shown in the picture here. 
Instead, the signals we measure from the brain are actually very noisy. And the signal changes during tasks can be very small. Thus, to detect the brain activation, we must, we have to think in terms of contrasts. It requires rigorous controlled experimental design. Like what tasks are you using to contrast the brain activities of interest? That is why, for example, in this study, we include mental rotations that say in task A, I am balancing a tree, but I'm so nervous of the fMRI tube. In task B, I'm rotating a 3D object, and I'm also so nervous. Then by contrasting task A and task B, we can obtain the brain activations that vary between the actual tasks instead of unrelated factors like, you know, being nervous. The greater than sign here you can see is the symbol that psychology people use to represent contrast-based analysis. Now we have already covered quite a bit on how to calculate brain activities when we introduce both signals. Here I will just summarize the medical imaging data analysis. On a high level, it takes three steps. Step number one is pre-processing. So I will just mention some buzzwords here. So you have sort of like a, an intuition about what is going on in this step. So basically, after collecting all the image data using let's say fMRI, pre-processing includes the computation of the voxel displacement maps, VDMs, to align our brain with head motion correction because you, know, you might move during the tasks. The voxel is a three-dimensional unit that embeds the signals in brain scans. The brain is made of numerous voxels and each voxel can represent a million or so brain cells. So fMRI doesn't actually provide detail at the level of a cell. Instead, it does at the level of voxels. So pre-processing also includes system noise correction, co-registration from the anatomical scans to functional data. So image registration is a classic prob problem in computer vision. So here we follow the best practice from psychology. Then we transform the images to standard space, like you know, people's brain, they may have different sizes. And finally compute a brain mask using gray matter segments of the anatomical scans to prevent the identification of signals within ventricles or outside the brain space. Then with the pre-processed data, we conduct something called a first level analysis. So we specified first level GLMs per participant within individuals. And briefly, this analysis model models the bold response to each experimental condition. For example, one condition we have in this first study is a mental rotation. Another condition is tree operations, like balancing a tree, for example. In the last step, we conduct a contrast and a group level analysis. So we first compute a pairwise contrast to determine the mean differences in brain activity between ex experiment conditions on the first level models. Then we apply a group level analysis with a second level GOM to assess average activity across all participants. The final result of this entire data analysis steps is a statistical parametric map of T values describing clusters of significant activity for a given task related comparison. Importantly, all the models and the tests we described before were done voxel wise. And we need to know that in human brain, there are over 150,000 voxels. So it is very likely to end up with spurious correlations due to multiple comparison, if we're not careful enough. In fact, researchers in the past have tried to see what would happen if we are not careful about false positives in the entire analysis steps. And what they do is they put a dead salmon in fMRI and they analyze the data without you know, taking care of a false positive. Then finally, the data actually showed that the dead fish was thinking in the fMRI. To avoid such mistakes, following the best practice in psychology and neuroscience, we apply something called false discovery rate correction for false positives. To put it simply, we basically just make it much harder and more strict to claim a positive result. 
So, so far, we have spent quite some time talking about data analysis to lead to this warning here, because it is indeed very important for researchers that conduct medical imaging studies. We need to be aware of such, you know, potential risks of misleading the, the readers with our conclusions. Now we can finally talk about the experimental design of the first study. Are data structure manipulations and mental rotations similar cognitive activities? Well, this is a very first study to use medical imaging to look at the data structures at all. In this experiment, we used two types of tasks. The first type is data structure manipulation tasks, such as lists, arrays, and trees, as shown on the bottom of the screen. The other type of task is mental rotation tasks, as shown on the upright corner here. I mean, psychology has a special name called Vandenberg tasks. So this study is also the first study in software engineering that uses both fMRI and FNIRs for a comparison. Also, it is still the largest medical imaging human study in software engineering so far. In our study, we asked all of our 76 participants whether they thought data structure manipulations and mental rotations are similar cognitive activities or not, like the hypothesis we did together before. So 70% of them believed there was no connection at all. So very interesting here, like our portion here is very similar to our study. So recall what you typed in the chat. Is your answer the same as the majority of our participants? Like, did you say yes or no? So now let's check what the medical imaging data tells us, then we will know the answer. We found manipulating data structures uses the same regions of your brain as rotating 3D objects. In a statistically significant manner, you use the same regions of your brain to carry out mental rotation tasks and data structure tasks. So um, both fMRI and FNIRs can discover these similarities. Just to uh, here give you a feeling for how we interpret some of these results, these so-called heat maps on the bottom of the slide here are visual depiction of brain areas that contribute strongly to the contrast-based models. So the hotter colors are the brain areas that drive the distinction between various tasks, while the pinkish area drive no distinction. That is just the natural color of human brains. For mental rotations, psychologists have found that the angle of rotation is a very good measure of a task difficulty, like how long do you need to you know, solve this task. For computer science, the N in big O notation, the number of elements in a data structure influences how hard a problem is in a formal manner. So it's actually expected in both computer science and psychology that our brain just works harder when task difficulty goes up. But what we found is our brain has to work even harder for more difficult data structure tasks. So in other words, the rate of actual work in our brain is higher for data structure tasks than it is for mental rotation tasks. So those observations about task difficulty in our study can only be measured by fMRI. FNIRs did not discover significant findings on task difficulty. Well, our thoughts, this may be because FNIRs has a weaker penetration power. So they just cannot give us more detailed information here. To summarize, this study required a lot of effort. So it is still the largest medical imaging human study in software engineering and this, the first one that compared fMRI and FNIRs in one single study. We found that humans use the same regions of their brain to carry out data structure tasks as they do to manipulate 3D objects, so-called spatial ability in psychology. And the task difficulty really matters for data structure tasks. We saw that medical imaging can reveal truths we may not be able to get with a pure self-reporting. So how can we apply the findings? How can that impact the software engineering? The hope is, we hope this work can provide some implications for things like pedagogy or training, technology transfer or programming expertise. At a very high level, the notion is, 
Well, we, we want to make novices more like experts. We want to train people so they are better at the programming, whether they are the first year students or an aging workforce. So the hope is if we know two tasks that appear different actually use the same regions of your brain, then training one of them may coincidentally may help improving the other. So for example, can we have you practice mental rotations and as a result, get students who might otherwise be underserved to be better at data structures? Well, this research provides a basis for future work in this direction. In fact, this year, our findings, the findings we just talked about, have already been used to direct a longitudinal study to investigate how to use spatial training to improve CS students' performance on programming. And we're also glad our work has been well received in the software engineering community, including receiving a Distinguished Paper Award from ACM at EXE. So in the first study, we have discussed on the details and how medical imaging works. And in the rest of the two studies, I will spend relatively less time and focus more on the experimental design and the fundings. So the second study is about writing code. Talking about code writing, in 1982, this computer scientist you can see on the screen. So some of you may have already recognized him. So this is Dijkstra. So he hinted his own opinions on what makes a good programmer. So he said in his paper that a good mastery of one's native tongue is the most vital asset of a competent programmer. Well, do you agree with Dijkstra or not on this claim? So everyone, hypothesis number two, is writing code like writing English? What do you think? 10 seconds again. Can you type your answer, yes or no, in the chat? I'm curious because this is a tough one, everyone. I think we have like three, two, one. Yeah, so Lars, can you help me? Uh, it kind of looks like 50 50, but I'm not sure. 50 50. Yeah, that's yeah. nice no, because, like I said, this one is tough. We will see why. So this is a second study will definitely give us the answer. So the high level question is, are code writing and approach writing similar neural activities? Informally, is being good at writing associated with being a good software developer? In this study, participants conduct both code writing and approach writing tasks. So here we used a two by two contrast task design for both code writing and prose writing, we designed two types of tasks. So the first type is called the fill in the blank task, FITB for short. What you do is you need to come, with, come up with a word or a line of code to make the entire sentence or function work. And the second type is called the long response tasks, LR for short. So you need to write a short essay or a function from scratch. We use fMRI to measure the participants' brain activities when they are conducting those tasks. So previous studies, that's, that's why this, this hypothesis was tough. Previous studies have hinted that the brain treats code reading like a prose reading, like when you read a code and reading English, that's kind of similar. This is especially true for experts. That's why when we have these results, it was super surprising for us because from the brain activities we found, there are significant and a widely distributed difference in neural activity between code and prose writing. Actually, these distinctions can be observed in more than 10 brain regions as shown in the highlighted areas in the figure here. So the hotter areas drive the distinction between code and prose writing. Just look back at the hypothesis. That was tough. Did you guess it right this time? We have 50% of the audience that actually guess it right. If we compare the brain activations on the fill in the blank and the long response tasks separately between code and prose writing, we can see that code writing requires more in parts of the brain associated with top-down control, spatial ability, same thing we mentioned in the first study, planning and the categorization, 
but the prose writing requires more in canonical brain regions that are associated with language processing. Except for similar implications on training and the pedagogy, just like the last study. More importantly, we hope the findings of this study can encourage more diverse participation in programming. So now we know that even if you are not good at writing English, let's say English is not your native language, there's a still a very good chance that you can be a good programmer. Like one more interesting indication here is writing code is different from writing English, but what about writing proofs? Like if writing proofs are actually similar to writing English, but different from writing code, should we as CS educators or researchers, should we deploy different training strategies? Or one step further, what about imperative languages and functional languages? Do people think about them in the same way or different ways? And how can we do to help them to learn better? And our Last study is to investigate biases and differences in a critical software engineering activity, code review. Just for the audience who might not be familiar with it, in software engineering, code review is the systematic inspection, analysis, evaluation, and revision of code. So in code review, you will need to read others code changes and decide if they should be merged into the code base or not. Usually when we think about code review, we are probably thinking about a pull request like this from GitHub. We can see the details of the code changes and a commit message or a comment explaining the purpose of the changes. If everything works well, everyone, when we review pull requests, we are supposed to make our decisions only based on this information, code changes and the comments we should only make decisions based on this information. However, research in the past has found that developers spend a considerable amount of time on social signals in code review, such as the picture of the author. Furthermore, in recent years, not all the code changes are generated by humans anymore. Automated program repair tools that we call the APR for short sometimes are already deployed in industry. For example, like Facebook's Sapfix. This means nowadays as a software developer, we may need to reveal code changes that are made by humans or machines. Now this is your last chance to make a hypothesis. Do you think women and men developers reveal code in the same way or not? 10 seconds again to type your answer. Do you think women and women, women and men, they reveal code differently in the same way? Do you think they reveal code in the same way? Yes or no? Two, one. Yeah, Lars, I think we can check the answer now. Justin, Justin and I said no, everyone else said yes. Oh, <laughs> Okay, so did you just like only one person that said yes, everyone else? No, said no. Ju Justin and I said no, and then six or seven people gotcha. said no. Okay, sorry, I got it. I reversed, so only one. Okay, very interesting. I think this is the first time I, when I see this is such a big difference on the you know distribution of the answers. So, okay, so in the last study, let's see. What is the answer? So we use controlled experiments to investigate uh, non-functional factors. Is there a bias on gender and identities in code review? And how do we characterize them? In our experiment, we ask our participants to review 60 pull requests. They are all from GitHub. And simultaneously, we record their decisions. So decisions here means, did they either accept or reject the pull request? As well as their response time, how long does it take for them to make a decision? We also record their visual and brain activities using eye tracker and fMRI respectively. So it's the first time we talk about eye tracking. Eye tracking can provide us information of a visual focus, like a fixation and circuit. So we will mainly care about fixations, which indicate the attention of human eyes. What are you actually reading? Circuits are this eye movement spatially, which are not really meaningful in our study, so we won't talk too much about it. 
So every pull request in the study is randomly labeled with an author, either a man, a woman, or a machine. So these human pictures are obtained from the Chicago Face database with a control of race, age, attractiveness, and facial expressions. We also generated two versions of code review stimuli with exactly the same set of pull requests, those 60 pull requests from GitHub, and author pictures to control the code quality. A stimulus example is shown here. So on the bottom right corner of the stimuli, we also put that indicator image just to remind the participants which fMRI button to use to accept or reject the pull request. That's why it looks slightly different from a real code review. So in this study, we use deception to avoid social desirability bias. So basically we told all of our participants that, oh, some of the pull requests were generated by machines, but actually all of them were written by human. Also, we did not review the actual research goals until we debrief them at the end. But before debriefing, we asked them questions like, hey, how do you compare the machine generated code with a human generated code? How do you compare, like, did you recognize any behavioral difference between women developers and men developers? We find that universal biases exist in how humans treat code reviews as a function of both the reviewer's gender and the apparent author. Behaviorally, participants spend less time evaluating women-labeled pull requests, and they are less likely to, ac to accept machine-generated patches. And the women reviewers spend less time on all pull requests. Visually, like using eye-tracking data, men and women participants employ different high-level problem-solving problem solving strategies in code review. So men fixated more frequently, like they switch between like different parts of the, the code review, while women spend significantly more time analyzing pull request messages and author pictures. It is also possible to distinguish women and men conducting code review at a neurological level. So this time, did you, did you guess it right? I think we have one champion this time, right? So we also find that participants do not acknowledge a gender bias. Like they, they reported that, like just like the majority of our audience here, they think there's no difference um, between women and men developers. But it definitely exists, like we said before, at the behavioral, visual, and neurological level. However, they claim quality difference between human and machine generated code, where we know none exists because all of the 60 pull requests are actually written by human. We just fake the labels and randomly, you know, combine the labels and the code. Based on our findings, we know that men and women conduct a code review differently, and there's a bias against a certain author identities. So what implication can we think about? So how can we use the findings to improve code review? For example, how should we design code review interfaces based on the differences? Should we just avoid showing authors' profiles at all? Or should we make it easier for developers to access the non-functional information they care about? Is there any effective training to mitigate the biases? All of them are future research directions for us. It is largely unknown yet. Like the three studies we covered in this talk, the majority of my work is interdisciplinary. You can already tell that. So this dia diagram roughly shows where my research interests and selective publications lie in. So my work spans software engineering, psychology, as well as sensing technology and hardware. So this talk today covers my work on the intersection of software engineering and the cognitive science. So this part of work is among the first that leverages various object measures to provide a systematic solution to understand the user cognition in programming activities. As an extension of the last study investigating biases on genders and identities in code review, in the future, I'm also interested in expanding the investigation on other factors such as tenure, age, and geological locations. So for example, what happens when you see the code is written by a 
Russian or Chinese company. Like I want to complete the profile and provide a systematic understanding of effects on the non-functional factors in code review. And optimally, I hope we can use the findings to guide the design of tools and interfaces just to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of code review. Another direction I'm very excited about is to improve the adoption rate of automatically generated patches by modeling the relationship between humans' cognitive load and patch features, including both semantic and syntactic features. I hope such a human-centered solution can improve automated program repair algorithms on generating not only correct, but also easy to read and more acceptable patches. So some similar applications here can be what hinders the deployment of formal verification? There should be more of them, but why does that happen? How can we change that? That's also something relevant to this future uh, research direction. I would also like to use software development practice to improve hardware software co-design. So I myself have worked on VOSI design before my PhD in CS, and I taped out several times in the past, and I observed the struggle hardware designers suffer in the design process. It is also hard for software programmers to code for hardware. So there has been research trying to ease the programming burden for developers in hardware design. However, previous work mainly focuses on converting syntax of hardware description languages, but doesn't check and consider other challenging factors in the design process, especially for software programmers. So such factors can be the lack of a technical understanding of hardware components, for example, what is a D flip-flop, or testing paradigms, hardware people use test benches and check waveforms instead of test cases, or the lack of a project history, benchmarks, and community support. So the entire development process is largely underexplored. Can we use, for example, Agile for hardware design, or can we use a fault localization in HDL? How do we deal with the combinational logic? Can we customize the practice in software engineering development to help with hardware development? Those are all the questions related to this research direction. So I haven't really got a chance to introduce this work in my talk, but in the future, I also want to continue my collaboration with Microsoft and the GitHub on this unique community in open source. So for the first time, we brought in the notion of open source software for social good to refer to the open source projects that aim to solve societal issues, such as aiming for the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So for example, these projects focus on helping victims in domestic violence, ensuring education equality in Africa, or most recently, projects that aim for helping frontline workers in COVID-19. So in our study involving over 500 open source contributors, we have identified very unique features of this social good projects compared to what we call technical good projects on GitHub. This community is facing with very different challenges. So in the future, I want to study how to better serve this community. And also our results indicate that open source for social good projects may be more attractive to underrepresented groups in computer science, then how can we use them to broaden the participation? So this work has been featured in the GitHub Octoverse report of 2020. It's, a, it's a public online right now. So during my PhD and master's, I had a chance to work with a lot of great undergraduate researchers. So I'm very glad that our medical imaging and human studies are very popular and attractive to them. So in fact, nine of my peer reviewed papers were actually done with my undergrad co-authors. I enjoy working with them and feel lucky to have the chance to work with them. So I want to thank them for their interest in the hard work. In the summary of today's talk, I present my interdisciplinary research on measuring cognitive processes in software engineering activities using medical imaging, such as fMRI and FNIRs, as well as eye tracking. Along this line of research, we have brought novel concepts from psychology, such as spatial ability to software engineering. We defined novel problems and present new approaches. These studies also include rigorous controlled experimental design. 
and our findings indicate potentials for a broad impact in CS pedagogy, technology transformation, uh, workforce training, and broadening participation. So all of our data is de-identified and it's available on my website. So thank you very much, everyone, especially for your participation on this hypothesis. I'm very happy to answer any question. I will keep the summary slide up here. Okay, thank you. Um, you it was a great talk. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Lars. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, do you have questions? Yeah, I, I have one. I was one of many surprised that there were differences on the code review, but I maybe I missed it, but was there any um, checking of whether the code reviews should have been accepted or should have been rejected? Like, did they get it right or wrong with shorter or longer time? Right, That's, that is a great question. So we know that, you know, even in our real, software development uh, life, sometimes just hard to say, oh, this, this patch is higher quality, this patch is lower quality. That's a challenge. So that's why in this experiment, we try to avoid defining which one's better, which one's worse. So that's why we randomly combine those labels and the same set of code. So basically for different participants, the combination between the labels and the code are different, though it's the same set. So that's what, so that's how we can, you know, kind of, you know, from the mathematical analysis, we can, we can say that even though we don't have like a concrete definition, which is better, which is worse, but if the code are all the same, the labels are randomized among all the participants, why we still see a significant distribution of acceptance rate? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes. I think it's because women do it figured out faster. That's all. <laughs> And also we see women, you know, they care more on the comment quality as well. Yeah, yeah. it was interesting. Thank you so much. It was a great talk. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. I have a quick, quick question actually. Mm -hmm. So for the, for the first, first of all, it's really nice talk, uh, really nice work. Uh, for the first section on the spatial ability, mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you could maybe if it's possible to disentangle some of the spatial uh, bits from, you know, the task. So for instance, uh, so I know very little about the, the human brain, but uh, I have heard that, uh, read somewhere that, you know, like arithmetic and counting, these are kind of very strongly correlated with spatial reasoning, maybe because they were originally done by, you know, people measuring distances or something, and that's how they figure out lengths. So like, would it make sense to maybe design this experiment with maybe not with numbers, with letters, or other kinds of things, or is it hard to dis disentangle, you know, this kind of influence? Uh, I see. Um, my understanding of your question is like, uh, maybe let's talk a little bit more about how spatial ability is actually measured. Like, you know, like what's the psychology knowledge about spatial ability, right? Justin? Um, so I, I think, sorry, I was trying to say maybe that there's maybe many different kinds of spatial ab ability. So uh, like, is the spatial see. ability re related to rotation or is it about the numbers? Mm. Um, is it possible to separate these things? I or is it, is it difficult? So first thing, you're exactly right of a definition of spatial ability. Spatial ability is a very high level uh, category in psychology. It involves so many different things. And to be very specific, if we want to, like right now in the discussion session, the claw machine one, it's actually corresponds to a subdirectory of spatial ability. People usually call it spatial awareness, like the distance thing you're talking about. But all of and also like, you know, um, if we are talking about those tasks, there are spatial ability tasks, like the one I showed, you just kind of rotate 3D objects like to see if A matches B. And there are definitely many other types of spatial ability tasks. For example, it can be 2D style, just for you to check, oh, can we, you know, do those two shapes match? Or or some sometimes, you know, it asks you, you need to like do sort of like a distance moving objects together to see if they matches. Yeah, but um, in psychology, all of those kind of tasks, they are all under the sp spatial ability category, but they're uh, um, disentangle them. Um, I would say on the brain active level, it's a very hard because human brains, we, so human brains are usually, especially in research, are divided into like around like a 50, we call it a BA, broad man areas. So every brain areas is, is associated with some special functions, but 
let's say first within one brain region, it's very hard to distinguish between, you know, in um, finer details anymore. And also many brain regions, they usually collaborate with each other. So it like, like you said, it, most of the time, it's very hard to kind of, you know, very specific to say, oh, this small region is only definitely associated with A, function A, and then the other is associated with function B. Yeah. So, so that's why usually when we report the result, well, you will see like a list of brain regions together reported. Yeah. I see. Cool. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Hi. <clears throat> I have a I, I have a quick question. Um, uh, with in that first study that you were doing with the um, spatial abilities, mm -hmm. you said it was done on seventy six participants. Yeah. Um, so, oh, what yeah. was the what was the diversity of the of the people that that was that was done on? I uh, I hope I have a I don't. I, I, I should have like some table somewhere, but uh, sorry, but may, may not be in this in hub right now. So first of all, among those 76 participants, 30 of them are for the fMRI study and um, 36 are for the FNIR study. And among them, we have definitely majority of um, just, you know, male students because we were recruited from CS department. But we do have, um, I think it's like a 35% of women, yes. 35% women. And we also have uh, both graduate and undergrad uh, students, but the undergrad students, the majority of our participants. And no participants that identified as neither men or women? Uh, in this, in this uh, study, no. But in our code review study, we have one person who defined them as they, I, I think we finally decided to just to take out that data to, yeah, to draw conclusions only on women and men. And but they were being and and in the the other study they were only shown, um, so in the study where they were shown whether a man or a woman had re, had created the code, it was divided into that particular binary, and they were people who were who were canonically looked like women or canonically looked yeah. like men. Yeah, that's so that's the number of variables we limit in this study, just because you know based on how many people we can recruit, we we limit the variable to be either men, women, and the machines. But you're right; it's it's worth investigating those non-binary setups for sure. Yeah. Well, and even just women who don't look like the stereotypical idea of what women look like, which they're of which, you know, that may also have an impact on. I mean, I've had I've had students tell me I've had a female student tell me that. When she wears a sweatshirt, her male colleagues take her a lot more seriously uh, than when she wears a skirt. Yeah, so I see. So you're actually talking about, you know, those when we show those pictures, will they actually introduce the other effects? That's a great question. So that's exactly why when we choose those pictures, we have to be really careful. So first, we use this, the most widely used um, uh, picture database from uh, the Chicago Face database is a quiet, so widely used uh, database of uh, human pictures when people try to uh, study the gender or age or those kind of factors in experiments, the first thing. The second thing is in that database, it actually measures many things like ages, like a perceived age actually, attractiveness, and all those things. So we, we indeed, we, we, we controlled those factors. And also maybe you are here, if you're more careful about, you know, do other factors affect people's um, decisions on those code reviews. So we make sure all the pictures we chose, they have like a very, um, like a similar attractiveness level, which is average in the entire code base, in the entire face database, yes. We, we have to, you're exactly right. You, we have to be aware of those kind of effects and we have to be careful when we pick up those pictures. Yep. Okay. And I, also I, facial expressions, facial expressions are also right. a very big affecting factor here. And we choose all the neutral facial expressions. Right. And I assume that this face database then, then also like divides it, is able to determine like whether the women are wearing makeup or not. You know, that, that's, uh, I mean, that's definitely something that is, I mean, it's not something you have to, that you generally, I mean, that definitely has an impact too, right? Um, or does I, that fall, fall into the, what they consider the attractiveness? Um, so just want to double check. You said uh, either a woman or what? Well, as you to say, it, if, if I, so you said that these, these, these images are categorized on various oh, categories, I right? See. And so like where I, I just was like, you know, so is it, is there like makeup or not makeup, <laughs> you know? 
you know, hair, hair, hair styled versus hair not styled, because I think there are a lot more variables that are that come into play mm. for people that are identified as women that that actually do have a huge impact on how people perceive women. Mm, I see, I see. Um, currently in this database, uh, I didn't see any labels say on um, makeup or hairstyles, but by scanning through all the pictures, I did not see any participant that have like a super, super strong makeups or not. So I believe when they are actually creating this database, they, they probably have their own, you know, protocols to direct those participants when they take pictures. And also you can see the t-shirts you mentioned, they all wear the same gray t-shirt and it's only show a little bit on the picture. It doesn't really, really bring any effects there. Yeah, but other things when you talk about, you know, would how they look actually affect people's, you know, kind of, intuition about their gender maybe i would imagine so and I, I i think that kind of studies also exist in psychology but here since we choose the average attractiveness for both men and women i would um i would say that if we find out those pictures with the average attractiveness among a certain gender let's just say we are sort of confident that maybe here attractiveness won't affect people's perceptions of their gender but if you, like you said, maybe I, I kind of tend to agree with you. It just should be more helpful because there's a you know, special measure about, oh, what's your perception of this person based on how she looks like, you know, especially on the gender. Maybe there's something interesting, but so far it's not, we, we don't have it in the database and we use attractiveness instead. Yeah. Okay. Thank I mean, you. Tom, Thank you for- you, you were about to ask a question, I think. Oh, well, yeah, um, but I think, it's um, more a question about how these uh, brain imaging studies, how you reconcile data among multiple participants. Uh, so, I mean, how do you get registration between brains of presumably different shapes and sizes? Yeah. And also, and, and also, uh, and also what, there seems like a, a scoring issue scoring. in terms of, um, you know, which voxels are, are lit up and how, uh -huh. you, how you make the judgment about whether you know, similar brain regions are, I see. are, are being activated. So how I does that work in, in this field? What's that, sorry? What's your last how, sentence? How, how does that work in this field? What, uh, what are the I standards see. for doing this kind of scoring and registration? Yeah, those are all great questions. So first, how do you deal with different uh, brains with different sizes? That's a problem. So there's a one special step in the pre-processing called mapping from uh, mapping to standard brain space. So basically there's a, I'll call it a big database there in neuroscience that people designed a special, um, I'll call it atlas of brains. So we call it a standard brain space. Then no matter which actual brain you're taking, there's a way to kind of map each voxel into the standard space. So you can simply understand it as, oh, though my brain, you know, is bigger than the other person's, but at this location, the relative, the same location, we kind of mark this voxel to the same, you know, standard space. There is that, is that done with, with, like, I, I would assume that there would be something like uh, to calibrate, say my brain, you put me into the tube and. Uh, and are then... you talking about uh, the, the correction of head motions? No, no, it's more like, is my language area a little bit off to the, you know, one side or the other than, um, than standard? I, I, I would sort of think that, that, you, that you would ask me to think about, uh, you know, chocolate mm -hmm. milk and that you would ask me to think about panda bears and you know a whole bunch of other things so that you could calibrate all the different things that are supposed to light up. I see. So I guess the first thing I would say is when we talk about those uh, broad membrane regions, which is the, you know, used by neuroscience and psychologists, um, people, we have this like a st standard um, categorization brain regions. But if you're thinking about, let's say, oh, for example, I when I'm thinking of a polar bear, it's possible that I have brain region A and B. Lit. But when Tom is thinking about polar bear, he has brain region B and C lit. That's totally possible. That's why in the data uh, uh, data analysis process, the first thing we deal with is analyze your brain activation within individuals. But after that, we have to do this group level analysis, kind of average everyone's brain activations together. So this actually went back to the I think the second question you brought up before, which is uh, the oh how do you call that the Scores, scores, right? The scores of brain activation. So here's how we do that. So first thing is um, we use that T values, which is actually after the significant test. So for each voxel, 
by putting individual data and this average model together, we will have a kind of like a this is statistic, statistical map with the T values for every voxel of this standard brain space, right? Then for each voxel, we also apply this FDR correction. So we only, so first we will only have all the locations of voxels that passed both FDR correction and is significant with a t-value. And then the second step is, you're right, we don't just report at this moment. We will have to apply a second level, it's called a scoring, which is just this, this role is sort of decided by the neuroscientists. So we say we will only report voxel clusters when there are more than 20 of voxels in one cluster. So in other words, if I see there's a one box, so that's significant, but if the cluster is smaller than 20, we don't report them. We just assume there's just some random thing happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically I would agree that, I mean, is that kind of approach in neuroscience, the, the really the best, the optimal, the scientific way to get the most precise reporting scoring? Maybe not, but that's, like so far, you know, how people do it. So basically we just try to use a statistical method and the experience, like, you know, based on the experience, we set up those constraints here to make sure people are not claiming false negative, false positive, sorry, yes. Thank you. Okay, so we are a few minutes over and I think you're meeting Tom next, so. Uh. <laughs> okay, so I can Tom and keep talking about okay. the, the talk then, yeah. But uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming now. here. It's very interesting. I, I, and Laura says, is everybody is everybody meeting on who who doing no, one ones that we're meeting on this? Uh, if you go or? if you go to the schedule, there is a different Zoom meeting there next to your name. So I'm not sure I have the schedule. Oh, and Laura, says, should I go to the the link to 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 use our previous Zoom link or? Yeah, I think that's the one. Uh, oh, okay. I blame Justin, he moved things around. 